from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. That is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Today's message is titled, Paul's Ministry at Thessalonica. Paul's Ministry at Thessalonica. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. So we speak not to please man, but to please God, who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We work night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we extorted you, extorted each one of you, and encouraged you, and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. May God bless the reading of his word. Paul was on his second missionary journey along with his co-workers, Timothy and Silas. They left Philippi and about four days later arrived in Thessalonica. And we see from Acts 17 and verse 2 that Paul preached there for three Sabbaths, so that would be for three weeks. Some people responded to the message about Christ, while others did not. And the persecution was so bad there that they were forced to leave. Thessalonica was the capital city of Macedonia, and it was a prominent city for worship of the Roman Emperor. So when Paul and his companions came in preaching about another king, they were accused of acting against the decrees of Caesar. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying, that there is another king, Jesus, it says in Acts 17 and verse 7. If Jesus is the real king, then Caesar is not. The message about Christ caused an uproar, and they were forced to leave. They ended up sending Timothy back to check in on the church at Thessalonica, and Timothy returned with an encouraging report that led to the writing of this letter. And Paul says in Chapter 2 of verse 1, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. What did the church in Thessalonica know? That our coming to you was not in vain. We know from chapter 1 that the gospel message came with power and with full conviction, where they ended up having their lives changed and transformed by Jesus Christ. They turned from idols, to serve the true and living God. And as we talked about last week, the Lord's message rang out from the church in Thessalonica. And I hope the message about Christ rings out from the Calvary Baptist Church. Paul's ministry was not in vain. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. Our visit to you was not a failure. No pastor wants his ministry to be in vain. Paul says our coming to you was not in vain. It was not fruitless. It was not without success. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10, Paul says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. 
Paul's ministry to the Thessalonians was not in vain. A church was planted, and it was thriving with an evangelistic zeal. We see in verse 2, But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we have boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Paul and Silas were mistreated at Philippi. They were stripped of their clothing, beaten with rods, and were thrown into prison. They were severely mistreated, even though they were Roman citizens. And instead of making their way to Thessalonica, they could have just threw in the towel and said, okay, we're done. But instead, they ended up making their way to Thessalonica. Upon their arrival, maybe they were still sore from the beatings they received at Philippi. Even though they received fierce persecution at Philippi, that did not stop them from boldly proclaiming the word of God at Thessalonica. And as a result, people had their lives changed and transformed by Jesus Christ. We see that Paul had a boldness to share the gospel in the midst of much conflict. As you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. And just like Paul, we need to have a boldness when it comes to sharing our faith. Like Paul, we have a responsibility, responsibility to speak up and tell others about Christ. We need to pray and ask the Lord to give us a boldness when it comes to sharing our faith. Sometimes I find the hardest people to share the gospel with are people that I am related to. It is much easier for me to go down to the boardwalk on Tuesday nights in Sydney and share the gospel with someone than it is with one of my own relatives. I remember wanting to tell my grandmother about Christ. And at the time I was attending a church in Glace Bay. And every time I would go to the church in Glace Bay, I would drive by my grandmother's home where I would pray for her. And I always enjoyed visiting her. And there were times where I would go and visit her with the intent of sharing the gospel. And there were times where I would leave thinking to myself, I wish that I had more of a boldness to speak up and tell her about the hope I have in Christ. So I prayed and I asked the Lord to give me a boldness in sharing my faith with her. And that prayer was answered. I asked my grandmother if I could share the Christian message with her. She told me that I could. And I ended up sitting across from her at her kitchen table where I told her the hope I have in Christ. I told her the importance of repentance, of turning from our sin and placing our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And at the end of the conversation, I remember saying to her, you need to surrender your life over to Jesus Christ. And I left her with a track, and let's just say through her life, she received more than one. <laughs> Sometimes the hardest people to share the gospel with are people that we are related to. You want to know what we need to pray for? We need to pray for boldness in sharing our faith. Maybe you have someone you've been waiting to share the gospel with. Maybe it's a friend, a relative. Maybe it's someone you work with. Pray and ask the Lord to give you a boldness in sharing your faith with him or her. Paul says, as you know, we had boldness in our God. To declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Paul courageously proclaimed the gospel in the midst of much conflict. As Christians, we want to constantly be looking for opportunities to share our faith with others and tell people the hope we have in Christ. And just like Paul, as Christians, we can expect opposition. Because what does the Bible say in 2 Timothy 3, verse 12? Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It doesn't say might be persecuted. It says will be persecuted. If we are living godly lives in Christ Jesus, we will be persecuted. 
And we are living in a society that is getting further and further away from the truth. And we can expect opposition. In verse 3, we see that Paul was genuine. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. Paul did not arrive in Thessalonica with impure motives. He was not trying to trick them or deceive them. Paul was authentic. He was real with them. Paul was not looking for money, fame, or popularity, as a lot of false teachers do. With Paul, what you see is what you get. Which raises the question, are we authentic? Or do we have impure motives for the things in which we do? Paul says in verse 4, But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who casts our hearts. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, their aim was to please God, not man. Paul was not looking for the approval of man. You want to know what Paul says in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10? For am I now seeking the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul is basically saying if I wanted to be a people pleaser, I would not be a servant of Christ. We are either looking to please men or we are looking to please God. These two cannot be combined. It is one or the other. And the question is, who are we looking to please? Are we looking to please men, or are we looking to please God? Because of our sinful, selfish nature, our default mode will be to please men. It will want us to seek the approval of men instead of seeking the approval of God. And I know there have been times in my own life where I've been guilty of this, where I've missed out on opportunities in sharing my faith because I wanted to be a people pleaser. When it comes to sharing our faith, one question we need to ask ourselves is that I believe will help in reaching out to others is simply this. Who am I looking to please? Man or God? As Christians, our aim is to please the Lord in everything we do. When I step into the pulpit every Sunday, a question I need to ask myself is, am I looking to please man or God? Paul says, we speak not to please man, but to please God. Paul did not water down the message to try and make it more appealing. He preached the truth, even in the midst of much conflict. Paul was faithfully preaching the Word of God. And I believe there are people today who want to water down the message to try and make it more appealing. There are people who want to take the offense out of the Gospel. People who don't want to offend anyone, so they avoid talking about the difficult parts like sin, repentance, hell, or a coming day of judgment. And ultimately they are looking for the approval of man instead of the approval of God. Paul did not water down the message, and neither should we. So we speak not to please man, but to please God, who tests our hearts. God tests our hearts. Proverbs 17.3 says, The crucible is for silver, and the furnace is for gold, and the Lord tests hearts. In Jeremiah 17, and verse 10, we read these words, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. Our hearts are not simply our emotions. It also includes our intellects and will. And God examines our hearts. And he knows our motives behind everything in which we do. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the hurt. God looks at our hurts, and He is all-knowing. He knows all things, and nothing is hidden from His sight. In Hebrews 4, verse 13, we read these words, And no creature is hidden from His sight, 
but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. God who looks at the heart knows whether or not we are being real with him. Paul says in verse 5, For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Paul and his companions never used flattering speech. They never put on a mask as a cover up for greed. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, so we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. They were not people pleasers who were looking to tickle their ears. Their focus was to point people to Christ by sharing the gospel message with them. Paul and his companions were not seeking the glory that comes from people, nor did we seek the glory from people. They had an audience of one, which was the Lord. And we see Paul's affection for the church in Thessalonica in verse 7. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. The metaphor that is used here is that of a mother caring for her children. Just like a mother nurses her child, Paul and his companions were sensitive to the needs of those who were in their care. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Paul and his companions had a deep love for the Thessalonians. They loved them so much that they were willing to share the good news with them in the midst of much conflict. They risked their lives in sharing the gospel with them. And yet it didn't stop them. It, yet it didn't stop there. They shared their own lives with them as well. We were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves. They didn't just share the message and say, okay, see you later. They shared their own lives with them as well. And I think this shows the importance of having fellowship with one another. Paul, Silas, and Timothy were like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. They had such a deep love for the Thessalonians. And the Apostle Paul had the right to receive financial support from the Thessalonians. But instead he chose to be a tent maker so he wouldn't be a burden to them. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil, we work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. Paul showed his love for them by working long hours so he wouldn't burden them financially. Now we know that he received some support from the church in Philippi, because when you go to Philippians 4, verse 16, it says, even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. So Paul did receive some support, but he chose to work as a tent maker so that he wouldn't be a financial burden to the Thessalonians. What did Paul proclaim? It tells us at the end of verse 9, the gospel of God. What did Paul announce? The gospel of God. God's good news. And I believe before we can truly understand the good news, we need to understand the bad news. The bad news is that we have all sinned, each and every single one of us. We have all sinned against a holy and righteous God who has to judge and punish sin. Paul says in Romans 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we know that the penalty for sin is death. For the wages of sin is death. What we've earned from our sin is physical and spiritual death. And we have all missed the mark. We have all broken God's law. And if we broke one of the commandments, according to James 2 of verse 10, we have broken them all. And the law requires perfection. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse 48? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The law requires perfection in thought, word, and deed. 
and none of us have kept the law. I am not perfect and neither are you. And God loves us so much that he allowed his one and only son to be the sacrifice for our sins. Christ entered into our broken world. He lived a perfect and sinless life. He upheld the law, fulfilling all of its demands. And he went to the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. In 1 Corinthians 15, and verse 3 to 4, Paul says these words. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. As Christians, we believe Christ died and rose again. And if you are here this morning and you do not know Christ, you need to surrender your life over to Jesus Christ. Confess your sins and then turn from them and place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. Salvation is a free gift, and like any gift, it needs to be received. The Bible says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And Paul says at the end of verse 9, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. So he talked about how Paul was bold even in the midst of persecution. He faithfully preached the word of God. We talked about how Paul was authentic. He was real and genuine. With Paul, what you see is what you get. And we also addressed how Paul was not a people pleaser. His aim was to please the Lord. And as Christians, our aim should be to please the Lord. And a question I want to leave us with this morning is simply this. Are we seeking the approval of man? Or are we seeking the approval of God? So we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. Let us uh, close with a word of prayer and then we will move forward with uh, communion. Let